and welcome to this ET Now special. I'm Nen Tara Rai. Today I'm coming to you from GM Financial's corporate headquarters in Mumbai. I'm here to interview Vishal Kampani. Hi Vishal, thank you for joining us here on ET Now. We're interviewing you on a very important date. One year since you've been in charge at GM Financial's, 20 years altogether here. It's a landmark day. No, absolutely. I think uh, this is a great day. Uh, it's my dad's birthday, first of all, which is very important. It's 20 years of uh, my working career. Uh, it's 10 years after our split with Morgan Stanley, uh, which was the first 10 years of my career. And of course, uh, one year of me being CEO, and it's been a great experience. So first, let's talk about the 20-year uh, work span, your career that you talked about. What's it been like? Oh, it's been great. I think the first 10 years was a great learning, uh, working directly with my father. Uh, doing investment banking transactions. Uh, it was all about you know, making sure our clients are satisfied, uh, closing important and landmark transactions. And post the split, of course, as you know, we had two joint ventures, the investment bank and the equities joint venture, and we sold one of them, uh, and we got some capital. And the whole idea was, you know, how do we build new businesses and how do we build back mm. our prominence and our legacy as JM Financial, yeah. right? Because it was no longer JM Morgan Stanley, it was JM yeah. Financial. So it was a lot of hard work and I took a detour where I, uh, I stopped doing deals for oh. three or four years. Okay. Uh, and I tried to build the equity business, the fixed income business, the ARC and our lending mm -hmm. platforms. Again, a great learning. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a great learning then. Yeah. So now if I can talk about the last 10 years, um, you know, after the split with uh, Morgan Stanley, how difficult was it? Now, it looked, to an outsider, it would seem like maybe, you know, it worked out to your advantage. Yes, uh, <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, I was very nervous. Okay. Right? So when the split happened, I must say my, my father was a lot more brave compared to me. Uh, and also because I think my 10 years of experience was with the joint venture, right? So I really learned how, you know, Morgan Stanley works as a global bank. Yeah. Uh, and that was all of my experience. Uh, but I think it's turned out well. Uh, the first two years was challenging in terms of uh, recruiting talent. Uh, as you know, the equities business was very tough to build back. Uh, there were lots of global giants who had entered India. Uh, and it was very hard to even, you know, recruit quality talent. Uh, but I think, I think things have turned out fine, you know, over time. Uh, and, you know, one key focus area for us has been, you know, to build profitable businesses. Uh, we haven't chased loss leaders, right? And second, I think, you know, we've been able to be true to our clients, right? And keep that trust going. Mm. And that's really propelled our growth story in investment banking even after the breakup. Because the fact is that, uh, you know, there were the three Ks, the Kampani, Kotari, Kotak. We saw the breakup with, uh, you know, each of the American right. banks take place around the same time. Right. And each, all three have blossomed. Yes, that's true. Uh, all three in different ways. Yeah. Uh, ours was uh, actually uh, the third. So, right, mm -hmm. it was first uh, the Kotari, then the Kotak, and then the uh, Kampani breakup with Morgan mm -hmm. Stanley. But I still believe that, you know, honestly, uh, J. Morgan Stanley would have been a very successful platform. So it's highly unfortunate that we had to break the joint venture with them. It was a very successful joint venture. Yes, but having said that, all three have done very well. And uh, what's also maybe commendable, not maybe, it is commendable, is the fact that even though uh, you, you were out solo, you were able to keep your clients and increase the client base as well. Yeah, so I would, I would really like to thank my team, right, our entire team. Uh, and I must say that uh, both my dad and me are very fortunate that our team stuck with us, right? So. Almost 90% of the J. Morgan Stanley team in the investment bank stuck through and stayed with us through this period. And without that team staying together and the hard work we put together, we wouldn't have made this successful. Now let's talk about the last one year when you've been in yeah. charge. It's a, it's a one year yeah. anniversary. Are you proud of what all you've achieved? Uh, well, one year is a short time frame. Uh, so I've uh, you know, given my board a three to five year business plan. Mm. Uh, but it's been interesting. Uh, so there are parts of the business that I, uh, I never uh, sort of looked after or ran, uh, which is wealth management, asset management. So there are two or three new businesses which I'm learning. Uh, and it's been a very good experience, you know, working with those teams and figuring out what they do. Uh, and also focusing on integrating and cross-selling more within the group. Mm. Uh, so it's a great learning process. Let's see how the next two, three years pan out. You don't tell me the numbers, but did you yeah. meet all the targets that you set out for yourself for yeah, the last year, one year? Yeah, this year we've met the targets. But you know, it's, it's, you, know you have a booming capital market, yes. right? And you have a fantastic prime minister. And you know, the macro in India looks good. 
uh, you know, people uh, people feel there will be stability. You know, it's like at a home. They do. A, they actually feel the stability. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, it's a funny thing. I was in, uh, I was on, on, I was on holiday in North India, and I uh, happened to meet someone who tells me that you know, if you have a grandfather in your house who has a lot of credibility and is fair then the joint family stays together. And that's how he looks at Narendra Modi, right? He's like a grandfather for India. And if he's stable, he's not corrupt, and he's clean, mm. that will go very well for all of India. And I think that is attracting a lot of the capital today in India, and a lot of confidence from investors. So you know that fear that might have been there that when you have the, all the Fed rate hikes, um, you know, uh, China, the fear that you know if China can, all this can happen, North Korea. So you don't think we have to worry about capital outflows and that India is going to remain strong. We saw 5.7 percent growth in the first quarter. Right. So I think, as I said, right today the macro, uh, the government, uh, as well as the prime minister, as well as 100 150 quality companies are really driving India's growth. Uh, having said that, there are challenges on the ground. We have this huge bad asset problem. Uh, we've had uh, three or four large regulations, right? RERA, GST, uh, bankruptcy code. We've also had the effect of demonetization. So we've seen a lot in the last one year. And it's very hard for me at least to pinpoint, you know, where is you know, the slowdown coming from and where is the pickup in demand gonna come from? Uh, so I think, uh, but all in all, you know, Indian private companies, uh, at least the good companies, they're very smart, right? And they're very focused on making sure that if they want to make investments, the investments need to be profitable. Um, so we can all complain about, you know, no new private sector capex, but yeah. there may not be a need to have more private sector capex if you don't see returns. Yeah. So I think let's wait for a year, year and a half. I think you will see better days ahead in India. So you don't think that things are going to turn around maybe for a year, year and a half, and that's when we're also going to see the earnings recovery, which should technically be the trigger for our equity markets, right? Mm, that's right, that's right. I think things will turn around, but they will be at a slower pace. Uh, and I think we'll have to wait for a year to 18 months for a, for a real turnaround in earnings. But by then it could be too late as well, right? You have the 2019 general elections, the government may turn populist. Is, is that a fear that any of the clients, especially the foreign clients, talk about? That is a fear, but I think it's factored in. It's I think India also looks very good relatively today, right? So I mean, if you have to put your money as a foreign asset manager, uh, I think India looks very good relative compared to some of the other emerging markets. And also I think uh, in the, uh, the local markets, I think people don't want to allocate more capital to gold and real estate. Right, and uh, you know, uh, deposits are earning you nothing post-tax, right? Yeah. So where is the capital going to go? The capital is going to go to equities. Uh, the challenge is that we have very few companies to invest in. I think India should have a thousand companies which are investable, liquid, mm -hmm. large, investable. So I would encourage a lot more primary market issuance, more IPOs, right? More companies going public, so we have larger amount of companies to invest in. Today, a lot of capital is getting concentrated in a few names. Mm. And those few names are getting very expensive. You even see these very stretched valuations now in the broader markets as yes. well, where you know, there is a fear that, hey, is this going to come crashing yeah. down? Yeah. I don't think it'll come crashing down, but you, know, you, may, you may see a dip. Mm. You may see a dip. I mean, there's no, there's no question. You're right. You're absolutely right. Things are stretched. Valuations are stretched. And the IPO market, the primary market is doing really well. Yes, Look at the is. great IPOs yeah. you've had. It must have been a great year for you. Yeah, it's been a great year for us. I can't complain. Yeah. Are, you, are there more IPOs that we can expect? Yeah, lots. Uh, lots. Uh, a large part of the IPOs, though, are in the financial space. Hmm. Insurance uh, seems to be the flavor of the season. Insurance, uh, NBFCs raising money through QIPs, or banks raising money through QIPs, or bank IPOs. Um, I think a lot of the action is in, is in financial services. But again, you know, if the general economy does not pick up, I don't think financial services can keep growing like this, right? You need an economic pickup. Hmm. Yeah. So in the last one year where you've been in charge, right. how many IPOs did you do, which were the big ones? Oh, we've done a lot. Uh, we're doing uh, SBI Life, ICICI, Lombard uh, this quarter, which are very important. Uh, so our focus is really on uh, the medium to larger IPOs. Our pipeline is very strong, so no complaints. Uh, we just hope the market holds up. Yeah. With that, I'm going to take a short commercial break, but stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be back talking to Bishar Kampani and also talking about the diversification that we've seen at JM Financial. Welcome back. I'm Nain Tara Rai. Today we're coming to you from the corporate headquarters of GM Financial. We thought it's the best time to interview Vishal Kampani. He finishes one year on the 1st of October being in charge of GM Financial, 20 years at GM Financial and 10 years since the split with Morgan Stanley. 
So let's talk again about that last one year. You know, you just mentioned that right now you're still seeing that people would prefer to invest in equities, not other asset classes, be it gold or real estate. But if that is the case, does that all go well for your real estate business? And uh, you're one of the best people to understand if there's a recovery at all in the property market. Right. So I think the property market has been going through its own challenges. Uh, and we really welcome RERA. I think the... Uh, the, the dawn of RERA is similar to how SEBI was born in 1992-93 for the capital markets business. Yeah. And I think this will allow the sector to clean up. What's happened in the last couple of years is people have lost confidence in developers. Yeah. They've not lost confidence in real estate being a good asset class yeah. because of the delays in deliveries from, from all these developers. Deficit, There's a trust it? deficit, right? Yeah. So I think RERA will do its job over the next 18 months to three years. Even as it is, exists right now yeah, and absolutely. all states not playing board. Is I think few confusion? are, but if you see large part of the real estate growth for us is the top six, seven metros. And most of those states have played ball. And a large part of the demand from an urbanization perspective is in those metros. Yeah. So I think we are well covered. So I think you will see a recovery in prices uh, 18 months to 24 months from now is my bet. Uh, did you say that 18 to 24 months ago No, I didn't. Well? No, I didn't. I said prices are going to be lower. Okay, uh, so and uh, Yeah, so that's happened. And I think uh, a lot of the inventory uh, may actually not turn out to be you know, finished product. You know, I was in Delhi last week. I, I surveyed uh, Noida for an entire day. Uh, Gurgaon the next day, and I think a lot of the buildings which are coming up them and are, are never going to finish. Yeah. So you have those in the inventory calculations, which will they actually turn out to be real inventory which people can live in? Uh, I really doubt. And you know the other problem then is that in real estate, because of just the way the regulations are and the structuring of the companies, etc., it becomes very difficult to sell them as distressed assets as well, right? Um, that's not true. I think uh, I think it's easier to sell yeah. them as distressed assets because. Most real estate companies do projects and specific SPVs. So, you know, we closed one of the largest transactions uh, in the distressed real estate space. We bought all of, most of uh, HDFC's exposure in Unitech, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously is a troubled developer in Delhi. And we've got, you know, five assets of Unitech across the country, not just in Delhi. You know, we've got Gurgaon, Ambala, Kolkata, Bangalore, and Chennai. And we're working on a plan with the management. And, you know, we, They're in uh, we jail. are hopeful. Yeah, as in not just the two brothers, the yeah. father as well as the management team. And I think we are hopeful that we should be able to recover most of the capital for HDFC. Okay. Uh, and the reason is here, they are project-specific SPVs, right? Mm. So the problems are isolated within the SPV. So as long as you can fix that problem at the SPV level, I think you're okay. So are you seeing more opportunities for yourself yeah, right now, especially are, in the north, I would imagine? Yes, we are very open to more purchases in real estate on the distressed asset side. Okay. And this is, of course, a joint venture, which, uh, you know, Vikram Pandit is also part of when you talk about the real estate. Right, right. Uh, Lending side. That's yeah. right. So how is that part going? Oh, that's going very well. Uh, I think we are very lucky to have Vikram as our chairman. Uh, you know, he is a fantastic visionary, understands the financial services business extremely well. Uh, and we have a real estate book of almost uh, eight and a half thousand crores now. Uh, we're the second largest NBFC in the real estate lending space. Uh, you know, and touch wood, luckily for us, we've had zero NPL still date. Uh, that does not mean we won't have NPLs in the mm. future, but so so far, I think our risk management has been above. How price. did you manage that? I think you know uh, a few things. You know, few things. One is uh, we've been very choosy about the developers we lend to. Uh, we like long track records, um, so we don't lend to new developers. We like developers who've seen cycles. Uh, we are very strict on collateral cover and cash flow cover, right? So if uh, you know if there are aggressive deals in the market, if there is competition which wants to underwrite, say below two times cash flow cover then you know, we pass. Uh, so you, know, you cannot focus on, uh, on book growth, right? We don't have any set 30, 40% book growth target. It's always a risk adjusted target, right? So if the yeah. risk is right, we'll be happy to grow the book at 20, 25%. Yeah. If the risk is not right, we won't even grow the book. So you'll walk away. We'll yeah. walk away, we'll walk away. So if you have the discipline that yes, we will walk away, we won't take the pressure of growing our book, you will manage to have lower NPLs. You also mentioned that you are in six to seven geographies primarily. Yes. Now, we were in, uh, so we've, for the first nine years of the real estate uh, lending business, we've only stuck to the southwest of the country, uh, which is uh, Mumbai, Bangalore, Pune, Chennai, Hyderabad. We've just started Kolkata and Delhi this year. Okay. And how has that experience been? It's been interesting. Uh, both are tough markets. Delhi especially is a tough market. Uh, it's gone through a lot of pain. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are, there are signs of revival. There's a new government in UP, uh, which seems to be uh, you know, very business friendly. 
Uh, and Delhi is selling very well, Noida is selling very well in the affordable housing bracket below 60 lakhs. Uh, and you know, because of urbanization, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we see a lot of growth in that mm -hmm. segment. Okay, so would you look at other cities as well? Is that part of the plan No, not well? right now, no, right no? Now, not right now. I think just with adding Kolkata and Delhi, and with the organic plans in the southwest, we can easily grow at 20, 25% over the next three years. And you obviously, I would imagine, taking a lot of distressed assets in uh, Noida. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are. I mean, few of them uh, can be turned around, but I'll be honest, a lot will not be able to be turned around. I mean, because they're just, you know, the psyche of a real estate buyer is if something is stuck for a very long time. They panic. They panic and they won't like to live there. You know, I mean, would yeah. you go live in an empty building? No. You won't, right? So it's tough. So many of these buildings, I mean, they really haven't sold well. Construction has happened. But and there are a lot of buildings projects. that have sold well. For example, the JP case. You know, I'm yeah. talking about it because it's in the front pages. You don't have to tell me if you are not evaluating. Uh -huh. If you are, no, we are not. We are not. We are not evaluating. Anymore. But what? How can this? Uh, what can be a possible solution for that? It's it's very tricky because, you know, the the trick is, if we have to fund that project, we have mm. to make sure that the balance receivables, mm. right, are enough to support the balance construction cost. To, to, finish the project, and we have some profit left in the game, mm. right? So till you don't have a revival in price, right? Nobody's gonna underwrite these projects. Yeah. So that's a very tricky situation, and I don't see a price recovery at least for 18 months to two years. But commercial real estate, on the other hand, seems to have recovered yes, a lot faster, and that's right. an important indicator for yeah, the you're economy. Absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Commercial real estate, yeah, but it's not necessarily an indicator for the economy, because I'll tell you the same issue you're facing in residential we were seeing in commercial three or four years back. Okay. Right? So there was a lot of excess inventory. All new projects were stored. Nobody was building new commercial offices. Mm. Right? So you were seeing the absorption of the excess inventory with no new launches. Yeah. Right? So we have to watch over the next 12 to 18 months if there is still a continued pickup in demand for commercial. Yes, if that continues, that's a very positive thing. And that is what is also attracting private equity, the commercial real estate space, right? Yeah, but that's, see, that form of private equity is very different. So we, we recently placed the uh, uh, Raheja transaction with Blackstone, but that's, that's completed assets. Those are some of the most marquee office spaces Even in the Bombay. DLF, uh, GIC the DLF, one is But these are very marquee completed assets, right? Okay. There is not a lot of private equity coming into new builds. They don't want to take a risk. Oh, yeah, clearly. exactly, exactly. So it's more yield. It's more yield-driven capital. It's not really growth-driven capital. So then where will REITs uh, feature in this? You know, we've seen SEBI once again tweak a rule, allow strategic investors. Yeah, I think hopefully, and you know, we, uh, last year we discussed this at the panel, right? So mm. I think I'm, I'm much more bullish on REITs than I am on INVITS. And I think in the next 12 months, you will see a REIT listing in India. Because, you know, we've heard the same guys talk about it, whether it's an embassy or a prestige or a yeah. Blackstone. But yeah. I guess no, but one they will. I mean, there have been a few issues, and SEBI has been very cooperative. Uh, and hopefully, with the recent changes, I think we should be able to list one REIT, maybe even two in the next one year. Right. Okay, so we discussed the real estate part of the business. Yes. I talked to you about capital markets right. earlier. Conscious decision to, you know, uh, ha have less focus on it. Uh, not really. I think uh, the uh, the overall pie mm. on the lending side and the distressed asset side and the real estate side is larger than the capital markets business. So you know, we I, I spend one third of my time even today on the capital markets and the M&A business. So it's not that. You have to where the markets are. <laughs> why <laughs> yeah, would you? True, uh, but that's but that's not the reason why capital markets is slowing. It's just that the the demand for money in the system is larger, and uh, you know, uh, NBFCs today are playing a very important role. Right, and meeting the need for capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, that, that pie is larger for us to focus on. Um, and incrementally, yes, you will see a lot more revenues from those segments as compared to capital markets for JM. So JM Financial, I'm guessing, still has uh, aspirations to be a full bank. You also have an asset reconstruction company. Right. And we'll also talk about wealth management, but after this short commercial break, stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching this ET Now special. I'm Nen Tara Rai. We're coming to you from GM Financial's corporate headquarters in Mumbai. We thought it's the best time to interview Vishal Kampani. On 1st October, he finishes one year being in charge. Vishal, I want to talk to you about the asset reconstruction business now. Uh, it seems to be the buzzword. A lot of interest behind it. Are people making money in this business, first of all? Uh, we are making money in this business. Uh, and I think, yes, people will make money in this business. Uh, so JM has had a very early lead, right? Mm. So we kind of have a first mover advantage. We were one of the first private sector ARCs in the business, and our logic to start the business was pretty simple. 
uh, if you know our background being in investment banking, we've affected a lot of corporate restructuring mm. and a lot of capital structure advice has been given to corporates, right? So mm. we understand the problems mm. which come about in a company when they're not financed correctly. So the initial idea was let's build an ARC. Uh, companies do go into distress, but they still have economic value. And if they can be turned around in terms of the capital structure and management change, then there is there are returns to be made. Yeah. So that's how we started. Uh, we have a long experience. I mean, we've turned around a lot of assets. Our IRRs have been in excess of 30% on the assets that we've turned around. Uh, and it's a very promising business. And in the last two years, of course, you've heard of a lot of global players wanting to enter. That's, yeah. Absolutely. And that is a good thing, right? Because I think India is supply short in terms of capital, hmm. right? Because the NPAs are upwards of 10 lakh crores. And the total capital in the ARCs put together is not even 10,000 crores, right? Yeah. So I welcome all the players. And I think if we work together, right, and we are sensible, then, you know, if it's all these players coming in, we can have some more momentum, you know, to recover these assets. Could you look and be a joint venture with one of the foreign players? That no, not at all. It's a very local business. Uh, you know, local laws, you know, working with uh, local courts, yeah. and I don't think we need a joint venture partner for this. And I'm guessing your, uh, the big premium for you also would be your relationship with uh, Corporate India, right? Yeah, absolutely. It helps a lot because, you know, people trust us. People want us to be the distressed asset partner. But having said that, we play a very thin line there, right? Because we are responsible to make sure money goes back to the banks, yeah. right? So, you know, you have, to, you have to be very clear on your priorities and what you want to do with the assets. The other big problem is that it takes so long to resolve a bad yeah, account. Yeah, right? that is true. Absolutely right. So has the um, insolvency bankruptcy code even behaved as an accelerator till now? Is it early days? We don't know. It's early days. Yeah, but it's a step in the right direction. But I can tell you you're, you're, you're bang on. I think almost every case which mm. we model, yeah. we see some sort of delay. At least one to and two years. And there's a holding cost. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, my 30% my IRR which we have in the ARC is on completed assets. You haven't seen the tail, mm. right? The tail could be sitting at 5% return. So it actually brings down your overall IRR. And, you know, you also have decided, I guess, to not go after the more risky sectors, for example, let's say power. Yeah, we've completely stayed away from infrastructure. No power, no steel, no exposures. There. And that is what I think the government and everybody wants, right? People to come and turn around the bad. They, they yeah. have the large chunk. Of no, you are right. But as I said earlier, see, we started the business to affect capital structure changes, right? Mm. Corporate management changes. I don't think ARCs today in the country have invested in capabilities to be able to take over companies and manage them. Hmm. Uh, and I think that will evolve, that stage will come in the next 10 years, where we will have operational capabilities. So for example, we are building that in real estate, right? but we haven't built that in other sectors, where we can take companies and effect management change and manage those companies. Uh, so when we can do that, we will be more confident in doing larger scale things in infrastructure or larger scale things in manufacturing like steel. But today it's a big challenge. I mean, you know, it's it's hard. I mean, how, how am I going to What is the average time it's been taking asset, you, yeah. for example, to turn around uh, one of the bad accounts, bad loans? Four account. years. Four years is the average? Yeah. Are you better than industry? Is that the industry average too? I think that's the industry average. Uh, in the US, it's 18 months to two years. And what about SMEs? You've been in the past very bullish yeah. about lending to SMEs, yeah. but is that a risky proposition right now, or you think? So that's a great question. Uh, we started our journey to diversify into SMEs and retail lending last year. And as you know, we've had demonetization yes, right after that. Yes, that's a risky Right, we've had RERA, we've had the bankruptcy code, we've had GST. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've slowed our plans a little bit. Having said that, our plans are not off the table. We would still like 30% of our assets uh, in five years from now to come from SME and retail. Okay. And right now the number is 10%. Because right now, like I said, it would be risky and I'm sure even, and the SMEs have slowed down as well, right? That's right, that's right. Absolutely So right, right. now it's not possible, I guess. And because they've slowed down and people who are focused on the SME sector, right, there's a lot of pressure on yield for them to show growth. Hmm. So all the quality SME lending is happening at very low rates. Hmm. Right, so as I said earlier, right, so if you don't find the risk adjusted return, we won't lot lend. So Vishal, we've talked about your last one year. Right. Now tell me about what I can expect in the next one year, in year two. Year two. <laughs> I think lots of deals. I think the capital markets are uh, doing very well. There's a lot of capital in India, uh, not just from international sources, but from I'm local getting a lot sources. of exits will also happen if you've got lots of uh, private markets equity exits. Uh, yes, absolutely. We are seeing incrementally a lot of promoters who want to sell their businesses. 
right? So most promoters want to sell their businesses when valuations are high. Mm. So I think you will see more M&A activity uh, and you will see a lot of capital market activity. So yes, we are very focused uh, on the capital markets business, mm -hmm. uh, despite it being 15% of our revenues. And what can we expect in the next 10 years? Uh, I think every financial services group at some point would like to be a bank. Yeah, you um, did apply for one. We did, we didn't get it, uh, unfortunate. But I think at some point we will rethink about it. Right now we won't. Um, so we have our plans chalked out on what we want to do and what we want to achieve over the next three to five years. Uh, but at some point between that third and fifth year, we will reevaluate. So, is there any particular reason why you're giving up yes, on this dream? Yes, because uh, I think. For three years. Yeah, because we want to reach a certain asset side, asset size. Um, so, you know, uh, RBI is looking at NBFCs very positively, uh, which is great. And I think uh, we are right now at 13,000 crores in uh, loans, uh, close to 12, 12 and a half thousand crores in distressed loans. So I think we we'll like that size to be close to 30 or 40,000 crores. Mm. Uh, and then we'll reevaluate whether to grow to 1 lakh crores over the longer term, do we need to be a bank or not. But I think up to the size of 35, 40,000 crores, we can very comfortably manage as an NBFC. Vishal Kampani, thank you so much for giving us the interview and all the best. Thank you very much.